that said, I better get into our study. We're going to be looking at, again, verse 17, but I'm going to begin reading at, uh, let's see, where will I begin? I'll begin reading here at, uh, at, at verse 10, just to give, because I'm going to give you a review, but we're going to be looking at, uh, at verse 17. So beginning at uh, verse 10, reading to verse 17, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Today we're going to be looking at taking up the helmet of salvation. Now, by way of introduction, let me remind you of a few things. Paul has referred to various pieces of armor that are used in spiritual combat. We are to take up the whole armor because we are attacked in various areas of our lives. And each piece of the armor reveals something that we have received from Jesus. Now, Paul identifies each weapon because believers experience spiritual combat and we're to be prepared for the fight that we know we're going to engage in. Now, I mentioned that verse 13 says, having done all to stand. Now, that speaks of taking the stand of a victor, feet firmly planted in victory. That's what that word is inferring. In 1 Peter 1.13, it says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we are firmly planted We are in the stance of a victor, and God has given to us his grace in order that we might be able to be victorious in in this warfare. But verse 14 used a different word for stand. It refers in that place to taking a stand. You see, on one hand, the word stand speaks of feet firmly planted. On the other, it refers to taking a stand. It speaks of standing and being ready for combat. It speaks of being braced for a fight. So that's something that each individual Christian is to be prepared to do. We're to have a mindset that is resting on certain victory. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Paul says it like this. He said, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward that which is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so we're to take a stand. We're to stand with the mentality, you'll see this in a moment a little more clearly, of the victor, but we also are bracing ourselves for the inevitable onslaught that comes against us. So Paul said we are to sink into the belt of truth. We are to have a settled commitment to truth. We're supposed to have truth that is evidence in our beliefs as well as the way that we live. It reveals this settled commitment to truth, but it also reveals an attitude and a lifestyle of truthfulness. Then we put on the breastplate of righteousness. As I mentioned to you, the breastplate covered from throat to the thigh. It protected our, it protects the internal organs. So the breastplate of righteousness reveals that we understand that in Jesus Christ, and this is so important, in Jesus Christ, we are righteous. In Christ, we are righteous. We have been made righteous through faith in him. That word righteous speaks of that which is morally upright. It speaks of a a condition that is acceptable to God. That righteousness, as it speaks of it, speaks of integrity, of virtue. It speaks of purity. It speaks of simple rightness. And so we fight from the position of knowing who we are in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was the sin offering. He took upon himself our sin as an offering. And so he, he gave to us that which we didn't have. He took upon himself what he didn't have. He took upon our sins, but he gave to us that which we didn't have and don't have, and that's his righteousness. 
So we have been made righteousness through Jesus Christ, and, and we have the righteousness of God himself on us. So by faith, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects us from feeling unsaved and feeling hopeless because those feelings can be a combination of emotion as well as the attack of the enemy. This is something I wanted to, to uh, really speak clearly about when I went through this. And, but I want to repeat it right now, guys. Every sin you have ever committed when you came to Jesus Christ, every sin that you have ever committed has been forgiven. Amen. We need to know that because a lot of people don't. We need to understand that every sin. How many of your sins were yet future when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago? And the answer, obviously, is all of them. All of them were still yet future 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ died for the sins that you've committed. And this is not to give us permission to continue in sin so that grace may abound. Paul said, God forbid. But the understanding that all of my sin has been forgiven is a very important thing. It's not just the sins up to the point where I asked Christ to forgive me, and then from there, I'm now responsible to live a works righteousness in my own life. No, he forgave the sins that I had committed and the sins that were still in the future. That is mind-boggling if you think about it, but that's the totality of forgiveness that you have received in Jesus Christ. Do you think that God is surprised when you blow it? Do you think he turns to, to his son Jesus and says, man, I never thought he could do that. Look at what he's doing. We don't surprise him. Nothing you've ever done, keep that in mind, surprises God. Nothing you've ever done surprises him. And he still forgave you. Now, that doesn't mean that I take advantage of it and continue living in sin. It means that out of gratefulness for what he's done, I turn from sin and practice the holiness and righteousness that I have in Jesus Christ. But every sin has been forgiven in Psalm 103, 11 and 12. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You know, you can go north if you look at a globe. You can go to the north of the globe and go, but You'll eventually, when you, when you crest it, you begin going south. But God has separated our sins as far as the, the east is from the west. Look at the same globe. And you can go off towards the, uh, the east, and you will always be going off towards the east. You never will at a certain point start going west. You're always going east, which means that the separation is infinite. God has separated our sins from us. He's removed our transgressions from us. Understand that and live that way. In 1 John 3, 20, John said, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Aren't you glad? He's greater than our heart. My heart condemns me, and we're going to be looking at this in some detail in a moment, but God is greater than my heart. Now, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. As I mentioned to you, shoes protect the soldier's feet from hazards in the road or in the field. So by protecting our feet, we are protecting our walk. And we are to personally guard our walk in Jesus Christ. So we stand, we're built on the peace that we have with God, and we, we uh, are built on the peace that we have from God. And that gives us assurance and confidence as we engage in war. So the gospel of peace has resulted in peace from God and the peace of God. And this peace with God gives us the ability to share the word with other people. The peace of God enables us to weather the onslaughts of the enemy. Like it says in Job 19, 25, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. We are continually girded with truth. We are wearing the breastplate. Our feet are always to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then the following three were to be used in individual battles. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. I mentioned to you that these three weapons are to be kept in what is called the state of readiness. So we take up, we raise up, pick up these weapons when we're in actual combat. The shield is used to defend against long-range attacks. Darts were used to distract and disrupt the effectiveness of the soldier. 
Darts were also used to disrupt and break up the unity of the, uh, of the, uh, the soldiers. We use the shield of faith by quickly applying everything we know about God. And again, we do that by faith. 1 John 5, 4. This is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So God's word to the Christian is a defense against the attacks from the enemy. And when the enemy bombards us, and indeed he does, we lift up the shield of faith. And so that's a little bit of a review. Now we're going to examine the next piece of armor, and that's the helmet of salvation. Now, during Paul's day, a soldier would wear a helmet during combat. It was made of thick leather. It was covered with plates or perhaps molded metal. And the helmet protected the soldier from injury to the head. I think we have a picture of that. There it is. And that's the helmet that they would put on. We are to wear this helmet of salvation because Satan attacks our minds. He encourages us to doubt our salvation. He discourages us in our walk. He wants us to forget the blessings that God has given to us. He wants us to forget the joy of salvation. He wants us to forget all that God has done. And he will do this in a variety of ways. But he uses uh, inference. He uses things to, to attack us in the mind. He wants to make us feel guilty. He wants to make us feel unworthy, which we are, but in a way that would, would keep us from, from confessing and, and uh, yielding to God. You know, all of us understand what I'm about to say. I was thinking of this just before I came up here. What is a practical illustration from my own life about putting a helmet of salvation on? When our church was young, we rented a, um, a school called Ontario Christian Elementary School. I have some in this room who went there, you know, uh, long ago. And uh, we were in this small uh, auditorium, and I, I would sit out during worship, and I didn't sit in the front. I sat in the second row for some reason. And I would sit in the second row, and I would just worship with everybody. Then at a certain point, just like I do here, I would know it's time for me to get up and walk up onto the platform and begin the Bible study. That's what we do, and I was used to doing that. And, and me, especially before I'm teaching, I want my mind, my heart, my thoughts centered on the things of the Lord, and I'm very careful with that. I, I, I don't want to be distracted by anything that will cause me in any way to feel impure or disqualified, and I can't tell you the amount of distractions you can have and the kind of distractions that you might have. Because all of you look in one direction this way, but I look in the direction and see all of you, and I can see around, and I can see what's going on, and, and I'm always trying to keep my, my heart focused on the right kind of thing, and, and, and I just remember this just a moment ago. I remember I was seated there in the second row, and the worship was happening, and, and me, I, I, was, I was kind of looking at my feet for some reason, I wanted to make sure they were shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. No, I was, but I was looking down. But as I did, the, the seats were very close, and there right in front of me was somebody seated leaning forward, and, and her jeans were down, and, and, and I could see these lace, lacy underwear, and I go, and I said, John, no, I... I <laughs> <laughs> you knew that was coming. You knew that was coming. <laughs> no, but I, I, I did. I, I looked and I, and, and God, I, and I remember just closing my eyes and God, I, I don't want any distractions. I don't. God, help me. This, I felt terrible. God, I'm so. Oh, I wish. And I really, I was really upset. And so I wouldn't even look. I had my eyes closed, and I thought, I don't need that. And so I remember getting up and, and actually on purpose ignoring that person as I walked by. I did not want to even look at them. And I walked up the stage, and, and I stood just like I am now, and I looked down as I was talking, and I looked in that direction. You know, this person had long, curly, blonde hair. I mean, I remember that, the white top. It was a guy. <laughs> True story. It was a guy. I felt twice as bad. <laughs> I 
And so all, all of us have had odd distractions, whatever they may be. That's not the only one I've ever had. I could tell you many. I have a habit of not looking in the front row. You will notice that if you ever notice, which I'm not asking you to, but I'm just kind of telling you. I never look in the front row, never. Because sometimes ladies have come who are not sitting like ladies. So I look over the head at all time. I'm always looking. Nobody in the front row. I have to actually tell myself to look down because I don't. Because I've over the years, just I just look over the heads and look into the back. That's what I do because there are distractions, one thing after another. And so, the helmet of salvation, I want to look at that with you because it's, 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 a, it's a piece of armor that is to protect your mind. Now, as Christians, we know that our salvation is a source of strength as well as our joy. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When it says the joy of the Lord is my strength, it is the joy of the Lord is the source of strength. My strength, Isaiah 12, 3 says, therefore with joy, you shall draw water out of the wells of salvation. Psalm 35, verse 9 says, my soul shall rejoice in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. So we know that salvation is a source of strength as well as joy. Paul's exhortation is when the enemy encourages doubt, and begins to steal the joy of your salvation, put on the helmet. Dwell on the reality of your salvation and be assured in him. Like what the psalmist in Psalm 43, 5 says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Why are you depressed? Why are you so upset? Why are you so downcast? Why are you so in that mood? Put your hope in God. It's like what it says in Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, the enemy encourages doubt. He uses our feelings. He uses our faulty way of thinking, our, our, our lack of understanding of what the word of God is saying to us and and he, he can move us through a variety of distractions to doubt that we're even saved. He also inspires false teaching, a false teaching that can cause you to begin to think you aren't saved or you don't have any faith. When I uh, was a young Christian, again, I spent, I got saved at 20. I went into the military. I came out of the army. I began to teach a Bible study at all at the age of 20, at the age of 23, and um, my mom my mom not only had come to faith in Jesus through me, but my mom looked at me as her teacher until the day she died. She only had one teacher, and that was her son who brought her to faith in Christ and who taught her the word of God. That was my mom. And so my mama, when I got out of uh, the military and all I went to, I went home, and I was li living at home at that time at my parents' home, and my mom came in. And spoke to me one day. I'll never forget it. She was so upset. She said, David, she says, I've been listening to the radio because she was a real voracious listener to the word and, and a reader of God's word. And my mama just wanted to, to grow and she was consuming the word of God. And so in, in every moment that she could, she would, she would get taught. She would listen to TV preachers or radio teachers and all. And one day she walked up and she says, I have no faith. David, I have no faith because my mom was ill. My mom was ill. My mom had illnesses from the time she was 24 years old until the time she died. She had many years of illnesses. So she says, I, I have no faith, son. I said, what do you mean, mama? Well, son, I've been asking God to heal me, and I was listening to a, a radio preacher just today, and he said that if I'm not healed, I have no faith. You see, the enemy uses those kinds of things to discourage you, to doubt you to make you doubt God, to doubt salvation, to doubt God's goodness, to doubt yourself, to doubt your relationship. He uses that. He uses that. He encourages doubt. He wants us to use our feelings. You know, I don't feel saved today, therefore I'm not saved. He wants to use bad teaching so that we begin to think that perhaps I'm not applying the things I'm learning and therefore I'm unsaved. He can undermine us, and he does that 
uh, quite, quite extensively and constantly. He wants to undermine the hope that we have in Christ. Sometimes the enemy will use agents to undermine our confidence in, in the Lord. He can encourage us to a works righteousness through his bad teaching once again. Well, you're saved, but you better keep yourself saved, and that results in frustration. Now, as for the helmet, the Bible makes it clear that God desires people to be saved, this helmet of salvation. And the Bible is very clear. His desire is for all people to come to him for salvation. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. God has done everything that he could, or sh could do to, to, to make it possible for us not to go to hell. But not everyone is willing to be saved. There are many who refuse to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. They hear the message. They were, sometimes were even raised in Christian homes, but they reject that message. Jesus wants people to be saved. Matthew 23, 37, there he is before Jerusalem, and he's saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 2 simply says, not all men have faith. So the Bible makes it clear that only those placing faith in Christ will be saved. This is necessary. In John 1, 10 through 12, Speaking of Jesus, he was in the world, the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Remember in the book of Acts in chapter 16, when the apostle Paul and Silas were there in the Philippian jail, and they had been beaten, they had been placed in the stocks, and at midnight they were worshiping and singing praises to the Lord, and and the jailer had a conversation with them. In Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer said to them, oh, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was very simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Believe in him. John six forty seven. I tell you the truth. He who believes in me has everlasting life. It's not something you work for, right? It's not something you earn. It's not something you deserve. It's not something that's pro a product of what you've done. It's not because you're so cute or so sweet or so funny or so nice. It's because he's so gracious. It's because he is so forgiving. You know, many of us have testimonies, and we give those testimonies when given opportunity. But we have our public testimony, the one that we're willing to speak to people. And that's the one that we've polished. That's the one that we have given. That's the one we repeat. That's the one we're familiar with. We have our open testimony, but we also have our private testimony, which is the real one, which includes all the things I would never want anybody to know that I was capable of doing. So you have a public one, but God knows your private one, and he still loves you, and he has still forgiven you. He has still accepted you in the Beloved. He has still promised to you that he would fashion you into the image of Jesus, conforming you into the image of Christ. He's, he's promised to do that. And God is not a man that he should change his mind. You see, salvation is received by trusting in Christ. And assurance is realized that Jesus has given you eternal life. It comes from Scripture, and like all our weapons, is applied by faith. In 1 John 5, 11 through 13, John said it like this. He said, this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. These things I've written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you have a certain knowledge. His spirit bears witness with my spirit, Paul told the Romans, and that spirit bearing witness with my spirit is telling me I am a child of God. The Holy Spirit who dwells within me bears witness with, the spirit, with, with my spirit and, and enables me to realize that I have been 
born again because there have been times in my life when I've wondered, did anything really take place? I remember when my, my girlfriend at that time, who later obviously became my wife, when she and I had a conversation in the early days of Marie's walk with Christ, and, and she said to me something like this. She said, you know, David, she says, I... No, you didn't say David. You said my Lord. No, but anyway, she, she said... <laughs> Well, Sarah called Abraham Lord. That's scripture. <laughs> That's a story I could tell you someday. That, anyway, she says, I don't, I don't think I'm saved. And I said, why? I remember saying, why is that? She says, because in your testimony, when you've shared with, with us how you got saved, you had such a joy, such a change, such a transformation. She says, I... I feel like nothing changed in me. And that is just absolutely not true at all. You know, even the very best by human standards is still a rotten sinner in front of Jesus Christ. And so God's, God's saving grace and, and his grace that he works in us is, is a wonderful thing. And you don't need to have a terrible, tragic testimony. Your, your testimony is true. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was a sinner, and now I'm saved. I've been forgiven of all of my trespasses. Thank you, Jesus. I remember hearing a testimony, uh, uh, hearing of a testimony of a little boy who was six years old giving his testimony in front of the church, and he said, before I got saved, I was a terrible sinner. And you're looking at a <laughs> six-year-old, and you're thinking, no, please, come on now. What did you do, steal cookies from your sister? I mean, please. But we are before the Lord. We are we are terrible sinners, and so what we do is um, we we put on the helmet by centering our thoughts on on what it means that we're really saved, and that provides a strong confidence for our future, and it gives us peace in the present. In Psalm thirty-two one and two, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. So our assurance and hope of salvation rests on the fact that sin has been dealt with. And it was dealt with when Jesus gave up his life for us as a sacrifice on that cross. In John 19, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. It is finished. So I'm putting on the helmet when I dwell on some very basic things. One, I dwell on the fact that when I was saved, I was immediately rescued from the penalty of sin. Immediately. In Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation. It's dealt with. In John 5, 24, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. I am not going to enter into judgment. That, that condemnation, that, that judgment, Jesus took upon himself my sin, and therefore I have his righteousness. I stand before God as one who has never sinned. I've been justified. And so I need to put that mindset on to understand that so i dwell on the fact that i have been rescued from the penalty of sin and secondly by grace i have freedom over sin's domination of my life there's a beautiful scripture romans 6 14 you might might want to mark this down sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law but under grace sin shall not be your master To whomever I yield myself to, to that one I become a slave. When I yield myself to Jesus Christ, in Christ I am yielding myself to freedom. To freedom from the law, freedom from condemnation. And that's a mindset that I should have. And third, uh, I have fellowship. We have fellowship with God throughout our lifetime. It isn't something that comes and goes. You see, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would would come upon a prophet, a, a king, a priest, but the Holy Spirit would also depart. That's why David said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, because there is a, a reality in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit would come upon, anoint, but could depart. The Holy Spirit departed from Samson. 
And he didn't even know that the spirit had departed. So the Holy Spirit can depart in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit dwells with us and is in us. And in a permanent sense, he dwells in us in that way. God has given to us permanent fellowship. Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Never will I leave you. Never, never, never will I forsake you. It's in a strong imperative. It's speaking of in repetition. Never, never, never will I leave you. Never, never, never will I forsake you. Never, never, never. That's God speaking his promise to us. He's with us. And a fourth thing is we are confident because we are going to be fully conformed into the image of Christ. 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then heaven, I dwell on the fact that I'm just passing through. Heaven is my future home. I am just passing through. I've had the opportunity over the years quite often obviously, of ministering to people who are about to enter into eternity. And I've always shared the same kinds of things with them. There's just something about this scripture that I love so much. Um, you know, I, I shared it with my uncle. I have an uncle who went home to be with Jesus many years ago now. Um, and, and my aunt had called me. She said, your uncle is in critical condition David, can you come and see him? And he was my dad's uh, young, a younger brother to my father. And so I, I went. It was in Riverside. I uh, went to the hospital there in Riverside. And, and I walked into, uh, into the waiting room. And when I walked into the waiting room so I could go see my uncle, um, the room was full of all these people. Just it was, There were a number of people there, several of them. And I remember walking in, looking at these people. And they're looking at me like, who are you? And I'm looking at them wondering who they are. It turns out they're all blood cousins of mine. All of them. My, my grandmother had 118 great, great, great and great, great grandchildren. 118. That was in 1992. We've taken over California. <laughs> when, anyway, so, so I went in. My, I had my aunt, her, her nickname was Billy, my Aunt Billy. She brought me in, and she said to me, um, David, she said, speak to your uncle. And she said, and speak like a Rosales. When she said it, it made me laugh. Because, see, I was afraid of my uncle because he had a rough and loud voice. And but then I remembered all of my uncles had rough and loud voices. So when my aunt told me that, I said, so that's where I got this from, this loud voice. It's from my my father's side of the family. She says, speak to him like Rosales. So I started speaking to my uncle, and she said, he hasn't opened his eyes all day. He was moving into a coma. He died of cancer. My father, my grandfather, my, I'm sorry, my uncle was uh, about 5'10", 190, 200 pounds. But as I was looking at him, all of us who have seen what cancer does to somebody, he had lost all this weight. He was just a, just a bag of bones there, just waiting to to check out so he could go to heaven. And I was looking at this man. They had given him chemo and, and the other kinds of therapies. And he had a real thick uh, you know, hair. His hair was real thick, and he had a mustache. That's another thing. We saw this mustache, and, but it was gone. He was bald. He was sallow. His skin was yellow. And I remember looking at him, and I said, Uncle, I said, I want to pray with you. And he hadn't opened his eyes or made any noise, my aunt had said, all day. And, and he goes, pray. Like that, I heard him. He said, pray. So I put my hand on him, and I prayed for my uncle. And I said to him, let me tell you something. I said, Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also, my uncle. I said, you are going to go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I did that with him. I've done that with others, others whom I loved very deeply. That scripture gives me hope. 
I go and I prepare a place for you. Very often we read the word in my house, in my father's house are many mansions, King James, many mansions. The, uh, the literal translation of the word mansion, it speaks of dwelling places. That's what the word means. In my father's house are many dwelling places. Uh, not necessarily because when you hear the word mansion, now what do you think of? You think of some, you know, 20,000 square foot, you know, that's a mansion, right? No, it's, it's a dwelling place. And, and when you go to Israel, you'll go to a particular place where they will show you this. Uh, and, and they'll point this out to you. They'll say, this house here, that what would have been here is the main structure. But they would build for family members dwelling places. The father's house would be here, and the dwelling places would be built into the father's house. And so when Jesus was saying, in my father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. When Jesus said that, he was saying, this is a community structured as a family. We all belong together. And we'll all be able to dwell together. That's why I say, if you don't get along with your brother and sister now in the Lord, you're going to have a tough time in heaven because you're going to be dwelling in the same family home, if you will. But he said, where I am, there you may be. I dwell on that. I dwell on that. And, and I tell you, as, as, as my life continues on and, and, and I, I see more of my friends and, 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 and family as they're departing and going to their to their rest with the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I begun, begin to long even more and more for that one day. I become more homesick for the place that has been prepared for me too. Because when we get to go to heaven and we get to see our Jesus, we'll also see those whom we love. They're there too. You see, one of Satan's chief devices is to tempt you to trust in your own works. When I was in, uh, I've seen this in Mexico City. I've seen this in in, uh, in Manila, Philippines, where, where the people are, are crawling on marble or on, on, on rock, trying to gain the attention of God or paying off a promise they have made. Um, no, you don't have to do that. Titus 3, 4 and through 7 says it like this. When the kindness of the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, our assurance is totally rooted in God's unmerited, undeserved favor. Salvation, again, we, we rest on this is an absolutely free gift from God. Absolutely. In Romans 3.24, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, I can voluntarily sin, but when I do, I quench the spirit, and there's a breaking of the fellowship that I should have with the Lord. Like it says in the Psalms, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But when I confess and repent and forsake that sin, fellowship will be restored. That's why Jude 121 says, keep yourselves in the love of God as you await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Stay in the sphere of the love of God. Remain, he's saying, where you experience his blessing. Remain under the spout where the blessings come out. That's what Pastor Chuck would say. Because the Holy Spirit wants to pour into your life. That's what it means for us to be a believer, to be a follower. Jesus in Luke 9, 23 said it like this. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily. And follow me. So as his followers, we offer ourselves as a sacrifice, and we do that daily. I put on the helmet of salvation. I abide in the loving grace of God. Satan says, give up. You're never going to make it. But Satan's a liar. In Jude 24, God is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God is able. In Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He didn't start a work that he won't finish. 
It's because of God's grace that I can continue this walk. And trusting in his grace has given me assurance. It's resting in him that you find assurance. It's resting in him that you find peace. That's why Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You see, of all people, Paul could have been tormented by what he had done. When he's speaking of his own testimony in Galatians 1, 13, he said to the church of Galatia, you've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how I intensely persecuted the church of God. I tried to destroy it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he said, I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That could have troubled him. It could have provoked him to refrain from preaching. I don't have the standing. How could I possibly speak in this way? But he knew the grace of God. That's why in 1 Timothy 1, 13, he said, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Again, the battlefield is our mind. Put on the helmet of salvation. We're not ignorant of how the devil works. We remain on the alert. And when we become discouraged and when we are saddled with doubt, what I do, and let me encourage you to the same thing, is I just begin to dwell on his promises. I dwell on his promises. Second Thessalonians 3, 3 says, The Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. I dwell on his promises. He who has begun a good work will continue it. He's going to complete it. It's not by works of righteousness, which I have done according to him, his mercy and grace and love and all of that. He saved me. And so I, I put together the different scriptures that I know. And, and, and I also ask God that I might guard my heart and my mind and keep them in the proper place so that I don't allow myself to travel in a place I don't want to be. So it's a discipline. It's a dying to yourself. It's an awareness of what's going on. And you put that helmet of salvation. I've been saved by Jesus Christ. And I've had people, especially at the beginning of my walk with the Lord, who wanted to doubt that God had done anything People, including my brother, whom I've mentioned, and others who knew me. Oh, you're just, you know, you're just, you know, one of these days. You, you go back to what you were, David. You know, because, you know, uh, you, you can't be anything other than what you are. You know, how many of us have that in our head still? That you've always been a liar. Once a liar, always a liar. Or once a doper, always a doper. Once an immoral person, always an immoral person. No, I've, I've heard all of those things because my heart has condemned me. My heart has condemned me. What gives you the right to talk about the grace of God? You're not that good and you don't know that much. And who are you? Who do you think you are? And God is very gracious because there are always people in church who will remind me of what I am or what I've been. I was doing a men's conference or actually a pastor's conference in another state. And a guy walked up to me and he says, you're not that good a preacher, you know. I never saw him before. I said, really? He says, no, you're not. You're not that good a teacher. I said, okay. He says, God has given me the gift of keeping pastors humble. <laughs> what a gift. Thank you so much. You know. <laughs> so people, people will tell you, or you may run across somebody who remembers you from the old days. Some of you have, haven't you? Who remembers you from the old days. And they want to bring you back. Say, so, you know what? You know, I've told you this in our church no less than two times. People have come to church here for services who have left saying, I'll never go back there again. I know him. I know what he was. I went to school with him. I know what kind of man that is. He's a charlatan. He's a liar. He's a thief. And he's lying to you. That's what he said. Twice, two different people. And I just say, well, bless you, Jesus. I've been transformed that much. Well, thank you, Jesus. You know, thank you. You know, it's a fact. But you know what? God is faithful. He establishes us and he guards us from the evil one. Put your mind on the things of God. Rest your hope completely in Jesus Christ. And when the enemy lies to you, just lift up that. Well, we'll see this. Lift up the sword, but put on that helmet and just keep going. Because the one thing I know for a fact, there's many things I know for a fact are scriptural. But I know where he ends up. And I know where I end up because of the grace of God. Because of the grace of God. Remember that. Put it on. So Hebrews 13 will close with this. Verses 20 and 21. May the God of peace. Who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead. 
that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we just thank you.